Uh, now we have uh, two parallel sessions, as Mitesh mentioned. I'm the chair for the career panel, Opportunities in Industry. And uh, today we have as moderator, Tanuja. Let me briefly introduce Tanuja and hand the session over to her. So Tanuja is a principal research engineering manager at Microsoft Research India. Her current work focuses on creating, nurturing, and deploying AI technologies that will have large-scale impact on the society. Prior to this, Tanuja was the co-founder and CTO of Data Glen Technologies, a B2B sustainability startup. And before that, she worked at IBM Research Labs India. Tanuja has been recognized as MIT Technology Reviews Innovator Under 35 in 2014 and IEEE Bangalore Women Technologist of the Year in 2018. And I'm glad to note that Tanuja is also a fellow alumnus of IISC, though I should admit that I never had the chance to meet her in the canteen. Once again, it's a pleasure to have you here, Tanuja. And uh, I uh, request you to introduce the other panelists. Over to you. Thank you, Lavinia, for the introduction. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Wishing you all a very happy 75th um, Independence Day of India. Um, I'm very glad to be with all of you here to discuss an extremely relevant and interesting topic for IQDT Data Science in India event. Uh, that is opportunities for data science and machine learning research in industry. Uh, we have got three eminent panelists to share their journey and thoughts with us today. And uh, we have already received many important questions from the participants during the registration process as well. So without taking uh, further time, let me introduce our first panelist today. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Lipika De. Lipika is principal scientist at TCS Research. Uh, and her research interests are in the areas of NLP, semantic research, and data mining. Her team works closely with the business teams for building AI applications that can use social, uh, social insights to augment business intelligence. Welcome, Lipika, to this panel. And um, I would request you to share your journey in data science briefly with our audience today. Thanks, uh, Tanuja. So um, uh, happy Independence Day uh, to all the students and uh, other uh, other audience who is uh, currently registered and listening to us. So uh, yeah, uh, regarding my journey, I started my journey from the academia. I was a faculty at IIT Delhi. And uh, after teaching there for 11 years, I decided to switch over to the industry. And that decision was indeed at a point of time where I just sensed that text data, which was earlier not so much at all into uh, the enterprise, in the enterprise's mind, I would say, who always wanted numbers and were very uh, much happy dealing with all kinds of number crunching. Uh, they were just starting to look at the uh, immense uh, information that can be there in the text. So search had caught on at that time, it was 2007, search was very much a part of our lives. However, looking into the content for intelligence and that is where data science became uh, a term almost you can say uh, in our lives where the data here is a mix of the text data and the uh, number data together. Of course, enterprises and industry uh, still have to measure their worth in numbers, whether it is the revenue, profit, uh, customer satisfaction index, etc. But a lot of knowledge comes from the text that is there. And from there onwards, starting with consumer intelligence, whether it is gathering it from data uh, that is there in the conversation logs, emails, uh, social media, and so on. Uh, there are a number of other applications that we are working now very actively with all our customers. So I am a part of Tata Consultancy Services Research. So as you know, our uh, clients belong to all uh, 
domains, whether it is aeronautical or banking or retail, uh, whatever. Uh, they meet and they are our customers. So it's a very exciting innovation-led projects journey that we are on right now. So while almost all the industry is well into using chatbots for communicating with their customers, as well as for their internal organizational aspects, uh, employ deploying chatbots to help uh, the organizational employees themselves to become aware of uh, what is going on inside the organizations. Uh, there are, of course, recommender systems for retail finance, uh, etc. Uh, so these are almost there, you can say, which is uh, like routine deployments now. What are exciting uh, more into the research, just moving into the domain uh, of applications are digital twins, which are exciting new applications of AI, working both on data-driven and knowledge-driven models, tw twinning organizations, be it a bank or manufacturing plant or logistics, uh, you know, working with multiple different kinds of data, modeling them offline, and then learning the loop early on uh, with predictive intelligence, prescriptive intelligence, and avoid uh, failures uh, while they are online. Another exciting area that we are working on is knowledge management, which is another very important area where we are not just talking about content storage, but also about discovering knowledge using AI ML on all that is stored in the uh, organizations. And as you can see, these applications are very domain independent, though there is a lot of domain knowledge that is required in order to learn uh, in order to make them work for each industry. So it's a very exciting journey that we have moved on. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I hope many of you will be a part of it. Thank you, Lipika, for uh, sharing your journey as well as uh, thoughts on the, your current work in the industry and how data science is being applied there as well. Um, now I would like to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Nikhil Rasivasia. Nikhil is a senior manager of applied science at Amazon India machine learning team. Uh, his team works on the problems related to catalog quality, shopping experience, and product insights, leveraging natural language processing and other machine, machine learning techniques. He co-founded Fasciet, an um, AI-based fashion e-commerce company, which was acquired by Snapdeal in 2015. He has received PhD and master's degree from University of California, San Diego, and BTA from IIT Kanpur. Another interesting fact about Nikhil is um, he is also a professional photographer and um, has been featured in uh, National Geographic. So welcome, Nikhil, and request you to briefly discuss your journey in data science with the audience as well. You know, thanks, Sanjay, for the introduction. And hey, guys, and happy Independence Day. I think uh, it's really uh, feels nice to talk to an audience on this day, um, just because, and I was attending the previous session too, and uh, how things have changed in India when it comes to data science. And I talk about a um, lot of work done in TCS. And I mean, my journey has also been, I'd say, in, in, the, in, the, in the language of data science, a gradient descent. Uh, I have personally never been sure of uh, what I really want and have explored multiple opportunities and, um, you know, from research labs to pure research to doing a startup to working in a startup and now working in an MNC. Um, I, I think there were some divergent steps, uh, but I think slowly it is converging. Um, in, in, in general, I feel um, data, set, data science has matured enough that um, it has applications in wide variety of industrial areas. And that's why almost every company, you know, uh, is thinking of a data science. And of course, the digitization of data itself is enabling a lot of additional applications. And that's where uh, my journey has been just, you know, uh, with uh, explosion of data, just trying to find opportunities where that can be used and currently working at Amazon, uh, which is a storehouse of large data. Uh, <laughs> It's like everything is online and everything is recorded and, and uh, it's a lot of value which can be derived. And even though it feels at times that, hey, what can I do? Uh, because the problems must have been solved by now. Uh, a lot remains to be solved. Um, you, you know, the advancement with newer features, newer featureizations, newer technologies, multimodal, 
and newer applications using the same data is immense and infinite, as I say, as I see right now. So, so that's a, that's a quick summary of where I stand today. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil, for sharing your journey as well. Uh, now I would like to invite our third panelist, Dr. Partha Talukdar. Partha is a researcher at uh, Google Research Bangalore, where he leads the Natural Language Processing Group. He is also an associate professor at ISC Bangalore. Partha received his PhD in CIS from University of Pennsylvania. He is broadly interested in natural language processing, machine learning, and knowledge graphs. Partha is a recipient of several awards, including Outstanding Paper Award in ACL 2019. So welcome, Partha, and request you to share your journey with the audience as well. Thanks, Tanuja, um, and uh, good morning to all of you, and happy 75th Independence Day. Um, so yeah, it's a, a great day to be speaking about data science in India uh, on this special day. So um, yeah, so my uh, research, as uh, Tanuja mentioned, have been in the area of uh, broadly language understanding how we can bring more real world context uh, into machine learning uh, algorithms and uh, have uh, fairly remained uh, constant over the last 18 years or so uh, that I have been uh, involved with the research uh, uh, world. Uh, in fact, I have, like a year or two back, uh, like, you know, I mean, uh, before uh, you uh, go for your PhD in US, you have to write this statement of purpose and I just like and I happened to go and read that, which was in like 2004. And I found that like, and I was remarkably still interested in those questions that I wrote at that particular point of time. So either I have made no progress at all, or like, you know, I mean, uh, the areas have been uh, really fascinating. So my uh, research uh, trajectory has uh, straddled both academia and industry. Uh, so, and I have, uh, uh, I mean, even during, uh, after my, uh, undergrad, I, I spent like a year and a half in HP labs. Uh, then during my PhD, I spent uh, close to a year doing multiple internships. Um, and then uh, also kind of like you know, back and forth between these two. Uh, and uh, I have uh, tremendously benefited uh, from the, those kind of interactions in terms of getting exposure to uh, real world problems and uh, also learning uh, from others. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, topics, I have been interested in how we can do more with less. Uh, so we talk a lot about big data, but uh, most of the real world problems uh, in, uh, that I have uh, come across uh, has like you know, lots of uh, limited amounts of at least labeled data. So I have been, although you may have lots of unlabeled data, so a lot of my research have focused on uh, how we can uh, make use of that little amount of uh, labeled data with lots of unlabeled data uh, to do something interesting. Uh, graphs have uh, prominently uh, surfaced uh, in my work as a, a way to uh, represent uh, knowledge and how and capture knowledge about the real world and how we could utilize them to make uh, machine learning algorithms uh, better. And, um, uh, and yeah, so like another you know, areas of like knowledge graphs are kind of like a part of that. And uh, more recently, uh, after uh, joining Google, uh, I have been focused on how we can uh, scale things along, uh, uh, along another important direction of uh, low resourceness, which is to like you know, scale in terms of number of languages where we may not have as much resource to kind of like you know, scale. Uh, from like you know, one language to another one. Um, so yeah, so that has been my uh, journey and uh, kind of like spent time in uh, both academia, uh, 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 industry, and also founded a startup uh, in between. Um, so if the audience have any questions uh, like you know, covering all of these different uh, areas, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Partha, for sharing your journey as well. Um, so as we are starting this discussion, what we would do is uh, we would start with some curated questions that um, audience had uh, asked during their event registration process. And uh, if time permits, we would like to take a couple of live questions as well. So I would request the audience to key in their questions in the Q&A chat as we continue our conversations. Um, so let me start with the first and the most important question, which uh, usually gets asked by the participants. Uh, that is, what kind of data science and ML opportunities are available in the industry 
at different career stages. Uh, so let's say like internships, pre-doctoral opportunities, applied data science, or research and research engineering positions. So uh, maybe we can start with Lipika on internship and pre-doctoral opportunities uh, available in the industry. Yeah, so, uh, you know, from TCS, uh, this is some internship was always there and we have uh, internships, internship programs, which are open during summer. We prefer the internship to be at least uh, for a duration of two months. Uh, something uh, valuable gets done there. We do have internship opportunities which are longer uh, for many colleges who actually want or allow their students to do a complete industrial project during their final semester or final year. So up to six month long internships are also available. Uh, for uh, the PhD students also, uh, we have internship opportunities which are uh, for the for a duration of two to three months because that's what most of their uh, their institutes allow because they do have often a teaching assistantship position also uh, due to which they are required to be possibly present in their institutes so two to three month opportunities longer always is welcome uh, if you have collaboration with a researcher of TCS and the guide, then oftentimes we do have very meaningful uh, internships carrying on there. Regarding pre-doctoral, it is very new. So this year uh, onwards, we have introduced a pre-doctoral position, which can last up to three years. It's on a consolidated uh, honorarium basis uh, that it will be there. Um, and we are going to advertise it. It has already been uh, shared with people who did internship with us uh, this summer. Uh, so it will be open for any uh, graduates who just want to, you know, experiment with the kind of work that is going on in the industry, want to gain some experience, want to write some papers before they apply for PhD uh, at uh, some later stage. Uh, and they always have the opportunity to convert it to a regular position if they are interested with the research labs. We are also hiring, we anyway hire uh, for uh, our research labs separately from the regular TCS hiring, which is called niche hire, where we go to various campuses to get them. From this year onwards, we are also opening up positions called research engineers for them who will be working directly with our different business teams and the research lab together to, uh, because you know almost so many projects we have which are very innovation led. So all that thin line between research and actual projects are sort of dissolving. So these are all the opportunities that we have. Thanks, Lipika. So maybe Partha, would you like to add on the research scientist opportunities and uh, pre-doctoral opportunities available um, as well? Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll start with the pre-doctoral opportunities. So uh, as uh, Lipika also mentioned, uh, so I think that's a great program. Um, so at uh, Google Research India, and uh, so we call that pre-doctoral opportunities. Um, so that's a two-year program for us. Uh, and uh, two batches have already uh, gone through and that's going to be like a yearly thing. Uh, the application start around like October, November timeframe and we are flexible in terms of the start, but usually it happens after like in May or June uh, once the uh, students have uh, finished their undergrad program, but it doesn't have to be undergrad only. Master students uh, are also welcome and even people working in industry uh, if they uh, are interested in kind of like you know, deep diving into a research a little bit more uh, before say going for higher studies, although that again is not a mandatory end requirement, uh, like, you know, uh, but it's, I think it's a great program uh, to uh, get exposure to research. And uh, in addition to TCS Google research, uh, Microsoft research has a similar program called research fellows. Uh, and probably IBM also has something uh, similar. Uh, now on the research scientist uh, uh, track, um, there, uh, uh, yeah, so usually like, you know, your people will expect some amount of like uh, focus research uh, to be done in a particular area that's also of uh, relevance. 
uh, to that uh, lab that you are applying to. Uh, usually like, you know, uh, demonstration of past research through uh, high quality publications uh, and like the you know, general impact in the area. So that would come from publications, maybe like in you know, a systems built or like, you know, open source contributions, which have some non-trivial and research components. So it could be looked from multiple different angles, but uh, some evidence of past research, uh, like, you know, exposure, ability to uh, chart out a, uh, a direction, right, with a significant amount of uncertainty. So those will be like, you know, some of the qualities uh, that will be, that are usually looked for in like a research scientist uh, position. Thank you, Partha. So um, I would ask Nikhil, so since you work on the applied science, uh, what would you like to say about applied science and research engineering opportunities in India? Yeah, thanks, Anuja. I'll take a step back, right? I mean, at a high level, uh, I, again, I'm very excited about what is happening in India today. Right? Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an article which talked about the number of unicorns uh, which are, you know, happening today in India, right? The number stands at 57 today. And out of this 57, 20 unicorns just happened this year, right? And the, it's a, the trajectory is huge, right? To me, machine learning in industry has always been the enabler to improve efficiency in all its processes, right? Uh, of course, there are dimensions of newer differentiated experiences, but the core of machine learning helps to improve efficiency, right? I'll just imagine, right? I mean, with 57 unicorns, the amount of data they are collecting and the amount of efficiency will become critical for them to scale from where they are. That, that itself is telling us there's a huge, huge scope of applied scientists uh, in the coming years, right? I'm not, I'm not even talking about established companies, again, PCS, Google, Amazon, uh, and you know, you know, tens of other companies, right? Which do take scientists, right? So again, the point I'm trying to make is uh, the overall opportunity, you know, is itself huge today and is poised to grow, you know, multifold in the coming five years, right? And uh, somebody was asking a question uh, and I'll just use that uh, here itself, right? And it's across the spectrum. Either you are a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD. Um, machine learning, parts of machine learning has been commoditized so that an, even an, a bachelor student can do courses, can do projects, and get basic fundamentals right that they can still be valuable to a uh, to an applied science team in a in, in an organization right so i feel the opportunities again uh, we can talk about interns amazon has a dedicated internship program for applied scientists uh, where we do take you know uh, from bachelors to masters to uh, you know phd's everybody is welcome uh, so uh, again um, i'm not going to specifics of that but in general, I feel the opportunity space is huge. It's up to us to um, you know, figure out which kind of companies are exciting and just reach out to their recruiting partners, right? Something or other does, does come about. So I'll, I'll probably just stop at that. Thanks, Nikhil. Um, so let me uh, take the next question, which is very relevant to what um, Nikhil said right now. So um, given that the applications and use of machine learning in industry is growing rapidly, uh, many candidates are looking for opportunities to transition from their existing career, like let's say software engineering to data science. So the main question is what needs to be taught to data science professionals? So is it ML theory or um, applications and implementations uh, or how to do research? And I think some of these questions were briefly addressed in the morning sessions as well. Uh, but I would definitely like to get your thoughts on this. Uh, so maybe I will request Lipika to uh, take this question. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, ML theory, of course, is needed. Uh, I mean, it's expected that one has an understanding of what happens in ML. Uh, the whole point of having supervision, label data, unlabeled data, dealing with it, the problems and so on. But what is becoming particularly important is also to look at dependable AI systems that can be deployed. And so over there, we are also talking of building systems, just like we had software building earlier. We are talking of building systems end to end. And what is most important uh, uh, aspect we talk about here is also building it in an agile fashion. 
So rather than having a fixed idea, no more people talk about waterfall models and so on. So being uh, uh, being familiar with the agile technologies, with the platforms that enable working with data on scale, uh, rapid prototyping, and uh, going into uh, you know working with the end consumers from the very beginning, getting an idea about what works, what doesn't work. These are very important aspects of building uh, AI systems today, particularly for mid-level uh, people who are planning to transition into these elements, uh, into a new career in data science. It is uh, not always the theory only that is required. So they are expected to actually know more about about building systems, what is working, what is not working. And when we say dependable, the whole range of dependability, it, it starts right from the security aspects to usability aspects to uh, also working with unknown data, which may fail. So therefore, the at the model level also, what is a good one to deploy so that it can deal with the uncertainties that are expected in a real world deployment to working at scale, I would say working on everything and again the platforms today, really we have everything which is on premise. So these are also going to be cloud deployment. So having a knowledge on these aspects is important at a mid level career. Now, after that, your domain expertise, which area you want to move from, all these things can make a difference in your choice. I would say there's a choice in every area. So one can make a wise choice in moving uh, for the at this level. Thank you, Lipika. Uh, so let me move to the next question. Uh, so many times, especially for PhD candidates, um, often get into the dilemma to decide between, let's say, industry research lab versus academia. So what would you like to say about, let's say, nature of work at industry research labs or applied science positions in India? So uh, Partha, given that you have first-hand experience um, working at both the places, would you like to share your thoughts on differences, um, uh, especially in industrial research? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so industrial research and academic, uh, I mean, I guess like, uh, I mean, if you are joining an industry, uh, right? So you should be, I guess, kind of like broadly aligned uh, in terms of like, you know, the areas that a particular company is working on and are likely to work on in the next uh, few years, right? I mean, if there is a complete mismatch, that probably is not a uh, great sign, but like, you know, I mean, in AI data science space, I mean, lots and lots of companies are interested um, so, so there, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, maybe just in terms of like, uh, research, uh, the research part of it may not be like, you know, very different, but in case of like an industrial, uh, setup in a company setup, you also have the product groups and, uh, and like, you know, I mean, uh, working with them and learning from them, right. I mean, what their needs are and then trying to see like, you know, whether research could support some of the challenges that they immediately have or are likely to have down the line is I think uh, kind of like, you know, one difference that usually you don't have uh, in case of academia. In academia, I guess kind of like um, the, the, uh, the, the canvas can be much bigger. So you could kind of like, you know, pick like whatever uh, problem you want to pursue, but in industry, I mean, like, you know, in order to have like a meaningful research, I think like, you know, you should be uh, to a large extent be working on what's happening in the company. And that also is a great opportunity in my view that like, you know, you can measure your uh, real world impact uh, by like, you know, how you seeing how your research translates and benefits the users and how that could also inform your research trajectory uh, going forward. So, so I would say kind of like, uh, uh, like, you know, both have like their own pluses and minuses. So in case of academia, the, the potential choice could be much bigger. Uh, but then again, like, you know, how do you take it and deploy it in the real world that is maybe missing to a large extent. 
uh, and then in uh, industry, like you know, I mean, you work with uh, these other partners. But of course, like I mean, there is like a lot of back and forth nowadays, and uh, there is lots of homogenization in terms of like you know methods, uh, technologies. So it's not there is no like a strict boundary between these two, right? And you see like you know lots of uh, people also moving back and forth, collaborating. So, uh, so I think there is like you know, lots of healthy exchange going on between these two places, and maybe the lines are much uh, blurrer now compared to like you know, before. Yeah, very true. Thanks, Partha. Um, so maybe uh, let me move to the applied data science question. So today, ML technologies are uh, kind of backbone for 24 by 7 automated operations in many industries. Uh, but integrating or introducing a new ML algorithm is quite different from well-defined, let's say, software engineering releases, uh, which are known today. So I would like to request uh, Nikhil to comment on the path for scaling ML technologies in real world applications and how the candidates should prepare for being a good applied data scientist. You know, <clears throat> I think that's a very, very relevant question in today's stuff and it connects back to the previous question of um, applied industrial science research versus research in an academic institution, right? I think this, this piece you mentioned about scaling up solutions uh in in some sense forms one of the central pieces uh to, to take again a, you, know, you know the applied in, in an industry in a in a um, university right the novelty is one thing that uh, is critical for success right how how novel you are and research publications are a good measure of uh, how novel you are in terms of solving a problem or even finding a problem right in industry the key is how effective you are in uh, creating an impact to the business metrics whatever the metrics be, right? And I think uh, just by solving a problem with novel um, you know, ideas is not enough, right? Uh, and again, Lipika was talking about uh, the end-to-end -end solutioning is what creates value for business, right? And in that spirit, scaling up the uh, solution, especially in uh, you know, web organizations, which have a lot of data is critical. The, when we think about scaling, right, there are two, three aspects which I feel are uh, very, very important, which gets overlooked at times. One is the cost. I mean, there are algorithms, there are simple classification algorithms, right, which could give you 1% better, whatever academic uh, metric uh, F1 accuracy improvement or ROC, you see, right? But at what cost? When we have to deploy these algorithms and which is processing millions of data points a day, you know, that difference in cost becomes more important. So how about you know, the cost optimized solutions for applications. So, so scaling one aspect is cost, right? The other is just the infrastructure or, you know, having a level of comfort or understanding like, you know, Spark pipelines, right? You are working with billions of data points. How do you process them? It's, it's a very different skill and a very, very different intuition to work on that. So my recommendation would be to, you know, upskill um, in, in terms of understanding how do we process large scale data? And there are a lot of, uh, you know, tutorials for that. The third thing I feel uh, which becomes very, very important is the idea of model management once you have built it, right? Models deteriorate. I mean, ML is about data and the patterns you have learned in the data and the data pattern changes over time, right? This is something we don't uh, anticipate when we are doing you know, uh, just research, right? We have been given a data set, we kind of get the best out of the data set and we claim victory, right? But how do we build pipelines or systems or ideas which detects model deterioration and be able to refresh the models without much investment thereafter, right? I think all these are parts of scalability design uh, philosophy uh, that has to go in before solving a problem, right? I mean, if you choose a very, very complicated architecture where features, I mean, how do you get your features in a consistent basis, right? So that, uh, you know, and if a new feature comes in, how, how does your model handle that? I think there are a lot of these dimensions which we don't think or um, get exposed to in a uh, just pure research environment. And I think this is a, the kind of thought process one needs to build up, um, you know, once they get into academia, especially when they're trying to, sorry, in industry, especially when they're trying to solve problems at scale. Thanks, Nikhil. This is, I think, really insightful and a different dimension of um, overall applied science that need to be looked into from the industry perspective. Um, so let me move to the next question. So as we are speaking about the opportunities specifically in India, 
um, I would like to ask another very important question, which is um, how data science is being applied for solving some of the um, important or crucial problems which are India-centric challenges today, and what the opportunities that are lying in front of us. So uh, maybe I would start with uh, Partha. Yeah, um, so um, yeah, so I have been uh, uh, and my group at Google uh, has been looking at the uh, dimension of language. So, uh, so India, as we all know, is a hugely multilingual country with uh, lots of uh, languages, uh, like the 1500 plus languages. We have 22 uh, scheduled uh, languages. And, uh, and, but like not a quality of uh, language processing in Indian languages uh, leaves a lot to be desired. And uh, depending on the languages that you know, uh, your access to information and opportunities, there's a big asymmetry involved, right? So I mean, if you know English, I think uh, like, you know, you are pretty well covered maybe for Hindi, like, you know, okay. But like, you know, after that, maybe there is a big uh, gap. So we are really interested in how we can uh, democratize information access for Indian language users. And, uh, and uh, but of course there are lots of technical challenges also there are to overcome this. So one of the biggest uh, problems is lack of uh, resources. So we don't have enough uh, training data to build machine learning models for all of these different languages. And it, uh, to make it sustainable, it cannot be like a linear growth as well, that for each language, how do you like you know, get from scratch equivalent amount of data? So we are really uh, interested in how we can uh, scale across languages by learning better representations, building multilingual models. Um, um, so yeah, so I think that's a great uh, opportunity I feel. And what's really exciting is that uh, even though there is uh, societal impact as like you know, lots and lots of people are coming online, have access to like you know, smartphones and better processing devices and connectivity is getting better. Uh, they are looking for like you know, support uh, in their uh, native languages. So there is a great opportunity to serve uh, that increasing uh, user base. Uh, but at the same time, there are lots of interesting uh, technical and research questions also to be overcome. Uh, and so I'm really excited that like you know, this convergence has happened and uh, like you know, there is uh, lots of work to be uh, done in that space and we and others, I encourage like, you know, people in the audience uh, who find this interesting to, to join uh, this journey. Thanks, Partha. So uh, let me come to a, uh, another kind of uh, relevant question, uh, which is important from the industrial ML research perspective. Uh, that is to solve any data science challenge, we need to have right amount and quality of the data available. So how data is acquired for industrial research and maybe comment on the framework of responsible AI, which is being used um, in different industries. And uh, maybe we can start with uh, Lipika. Yeah, that is something which is coming back again and again. And it's a very interesting question. Uh, that uh, so my personal experience in starting with industrial data was that all the text that has text corpus that had been created from Reuters news etc do not really work when they start working with actual enterprise data which is very noisy noisy as in terms of uh, language that is used which can be Today we have a lot of code mixed language and otherwise also the, the terminologies are completely different. So all enterprises, all organizations will have their own abbreviations, own text, own meaning for all the words, etc. So therefore it actually needs working on different types of models. Uh, that are uh, useful in a particular context. And that is where the key problem starts that we don't have too much of label data to start with. We cannot ask customers that please label, uh, you know, 5,000 sample pieces of your data. So therefore, a lot of our focus is on how to use distance supervision uh, techniques or unlabeled, unsupervised techniques in order to design solutions. Our focus is on building working solutions uh, that will uh, solve the problem. And also at times we build 
systems which are with humans in the loop so therefore we don't want to wrong decisions to go what we want to focus on is how to reduce the effort of human beings uh, by not having to do the routine tasks maybe have a look at the ai generated decision and also give a feedback so that the model can learn. So therefore, what we are essentially talking of are different uh, types of learning paradigms like reinforcement learning, which will help in models to scale. We we'll look at a lot of unsupervised techniques. We we'll look at mix of supervised and unsupervised and so on. So those are the kind of efforts we need, which are completely different uh, when we work with enterprise data. I talk from language, perspective when I work on images it's the same thing they are not nice clean images that come they are uh, all different kinds of images or forms invoice etc each of which pose a mini research problem itself so that's why life remains exciting also uh, and uh, it's challenging but then you know you have to solve the problem so uh, different kinds of uh, techniques, adaptation of the techniques that work is what we look at. Thank you, Lipika. So uh, now in the interest of time, let me uh, uh, take one quick question from the live chat. Um, so the question is related to our earlier and the first question. So uh, the participants would like to know how can um, anyone approach to these internships available within the companies? So what are the ways in which you know they can connect? So uh, maybe I would request um, uh, any one of you to comment on what would be the right way for them to get started to connect for the internships. Um, I can go first. I mean, uh, see, Amazon at least uh, uh, has just searching on the Amazon website. Uh, there is a, a jobs portal. Uh, usually gives out all the open positions. Um, they do run um, 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 kind of programs in different universities. So there is uh, you know, not all of them, but some universities, Amazon has representatives, which kind of announces. And the internship program at least will start uh, in the coming months. So I just keep an eye out, uh, but the website would be the first place I would start to figure out what opportunities are available from a both internship and a job openings point of view. And I'm just sorry, I'm answering another question uh, along the way. Uh, uh, somebody asked, you know, for undergrads also. Uh, yes, you know, undergrads being hired as an applied scientist is does happen if it's a stellar performance, but there are opportunities in research engineering and all, even for undergrads. So. Uh, it's not the case that it's only for PhD students. Thanks, Nikhil. So, uh, Lipika or Partha, do you want to add anything to this? So, uh, oh, sorry. Lipika, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, our same as uh, what Nikhil mentioned, we have our internships uh, open for all the institutes with which we have uh, campus recruitment. So it almost goes on at the same scale. Um, and also what I would like to additionally point out is we do accept internship applications through uh, personal connect. So you can write to us on LinkedIn, uh, through the ACM channels, uh, just get in touch with us with your resume. If we have uh, projects at that time, which we want to float for internships, you can get in touch. I think networking is a good way to get in touch with people for internships. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think very similar comments. So I think the the, the carriers websites uh, will be like in a good place, but also in terms of like, you know, how to maximize your chances of getting selected. I think doing uh, relevant works and doing interesting projects uh, can be one uh, way. So there are like you know, lots of uh, different like uh, research papers and all that are published uh, from these different labs, uh, like the various hackathon and challenges that are uh, organized. So if you have done like you know, prior work in these types of areas, then I think uh, your candidature will be like you know, potentially more uh, appealing uh, to the recruiting teams. Um, so that could be one uh, other way, but of course that need not be only exclusive that everyone needs to work on those areas, but uh, like uh, doing relevant work and interesting projects. Can be Thank you. 
Um, so, of course, we could not answer many questions during this limited time. So I would like to acknowledge uh, that um, uh, we could not take a lot of questions which are coming on the uh, Q&A chat as well. Uh, but uh, the organizing committee is looking into answering uh, some more questions in some form on IKDD site. So keep a watch on IKDD site and you might get uh, some more um, uh, answers, uh, kind of questions answered in next uh, few days or weeks. So with this, um, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists for their valuable thoughts and insights. And I would like to thank the audience for this lovely and uh, lively session. And um, uh, thanking the organizers, Lavanya, Devdut, and uh, Srujana for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Lavanya, and uh, over to you. <laughs>